Welcome to the fifth of our fall 2020 lectures. Tonight's lecture was named for Jeannie Graustein, a member of our community who worked for the Office of Catholic Social Justice Ministries for the Archdiocese of Hartford for many years. She had a particular passion for environmental justice, which she shared with her husband, Bill. We welcome the Graustein family who might be watching tonight and share their gratitude for Jeannie's life with them. Dr. Teresa Berger, our speaker tonight, is Professor of Liturgical Studies at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music and Yale Divinity School, where she also holds an appointment as a Thomas E. Golden Jr. Professor of Catholic Theology. Her most recent publications include an edited volume, Full of Your Glory, Liturgy, Cosmos, Creation, and a monograph, At Worship, Liturgical Practices in Digital Worlds. Previous publications include Gender Differences and the Making of Liturgical History and Fragments of Real Presence. Professor Berger also regularly writes for the liturgy blog, Pray Tell. Originally from Germany, she has been a visiting professor at the universities of Mainz, Münster, Berlin, and Uppsala. As a reminder, questions can be submitted on Facebook or through the link that was sent out, bit.ly slash STM lectures. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Berger tonight, although she is very much already a part of our community, as she addresses the topic, All Creation Worships, Pope Francis's vision of ecological conversion and communion. Welcome. Thank you, Sister Jen. Thank you to all of you for being here. And thank you to Jeannie and to Bill Graustein for endowing this lectureship. With Jeannie's commitment to environmental justice in mind, I want to begin by acknowledging the land on which I stand and from which I speak. And I will use the official land acknowledgement of Yale University to do so. I acknowledge that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shaktikok, Golden Hill, Pogoset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Al Algonquian-speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. I honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. And now to the subject matter at hand. We all live and we pray and worship in turbulent times. You certainly do not need me and this lecture to tell you this. But allow me a brief look at the narrative that often gets told about the crises of the last few months. If you tell this story of 2020 from within the US, Three crises are routinely invoked to map the year to date. The first crisis emerged with the coming of COVID-19, the virulent pandemic that impacted countries around the globe, but spread more ferociously in the US than almost anywhere else. This crisis initiated a second one, namely substantial economic hardship, which impacted sadly but predictably minoritized groups, indigenous peoples, African Americans, Hispanics, low income families, people who live with disabilities or who experience homelessness. And related to that reality, so the story goes in the US, is the third crisis which erupted when a video of the murder of George Floyd went viral in late May, rendering visible for all to see systemic violence against black and brown bodies. 
Now, as disturbing as this map of the three crises in 2020 is, this map, I want to suggest, hides what is the deepest foundational crisis of our time, one that underlies and contributes to the three crises named above. It is the environmental emergency. Without it, the other three crises might be addressed, possibly contained. But with this crucial crisis coming into view, nothing of what is done in relation to the other three crises will ultimately lead to future flourishing of life on planet Earth. So far, so bad. Enter Pope Francis. In his new encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, and in recent messages, especially for the World Day of uh, Prayer for the Care of Creation on September 1 of this year, and then for the global TEDx countdown on climate change just a couple of weeks ago, Pope Francis encourages us to not lose focus on this environmental emergency of our time. In the video message for the TEDx countdown, the Pope stressed that we must see how everything in the world is connected and that, as the pandemic has reminded us, we are interdependent on one another and also dependent on our Mother Earth. Now again, I'm sure you do not, not need me to offer data and statistics and charts tonight of these realities. All these are readily available, and sadly, they rarely seem to change minds. So suffice it to say, again, that we live and we worship on a planet clearly in peril. Pope Francis, in fact, has linked the environmental emergency and the 2020 pandemic in Fratelli Tutti. And here is just one quote from that encyclical. If everything is connected, it is hard to imagine that this global disaster, the pandemic, is unrelated to our way of approaching reality, our claim to be absolute masters of our own lives and of all that exists. The world is itself crying out in rebellion. And just as a footnote, if you wonder how a case like that can be made, namely that the global disaster, that is the pandemic, might be linked uh, to the environmental emergency we are living with, um, science suggests that uh, a number of uh, human-made uh, um, elements of climate change have contributed to the ferocity of uh, the pandemic as we have seen it. Once again, so far, so bad. What I want to focus on tonight, though, is one specific element, maybe of hope, but at least of a possible tiny response to this crisis. For me, initially, this emerged out of pondering Pope Francis's encyclical of 2015, Laudato Si. And in case you think that now that we have Fratelli Tutti, Laudato Si is no longer that relevant, please think again. We are in fact currently right in the middle of what the Vatican declared as the special anniversary year of Laudato Si, uh, which runs through May 2021. Now, 
My own specific interest in Laudato Si and my scholarly field, liturgical studies, might seem an odd conversation partner with the Pope's encyclical, his insistence on um, taking seriously um, the planetary emergency of our time. So one could ask, what on earth and in heaven does that have to do with, does worship have to do with the planetary emergency we are living with? Actually, I want to claim everything. And I will spend the rest of this presentation seeking to persuade you of that. The heart of my argument will go something like this. Pope Francis has repeatedly hinted, uh, particularly in Laudato Si, at a community, a kinship relation between human beings and everything created. And out of that kinship has grown a vision of what he calls a universal family or a sublime communion or throughout Laudato Si, a universal communion. I'm giving you just one of the quotes here uh, from Laudato Si. We'll come back to it. I want to hold this notion of a universal communion among all created things, together with a vision embedded in an ancient liturgical text, the Te Deum. And here you have it directly from the Vatican website in English translation. The sentence that is particularly important to me is highlighted and has given the title uh, to my uh, talk today, All Creation Worships. What I want to argue, what I'm gesturing towards, is that we might consider in our praying and in our worship that we enter into God's presence in communion with all that is, namely with everything created by God as we are. Now, how might we get to understanding and inhabiting and practicing worship like this? Probably only by something like ecological conversion, a new way of seeing, feeling, thinking, acting, a turning away from something and a turning towards something else. And once again, Pope Francis, in his recent message for the 2020 World Day of Prayer for the Care of Creation, calls us to such turning, to repentance. I quote, we have broken the bonds of our relationship with the Creator, with our fellow human beings, and with the rest of creation, we need to heal the damaged relationships that are essential to supporting us and the entire fabric of life. Now, my own field of study, liturgical studies, has in the 20th century in particular, championed an image of worship Ship that directly seems to contradict this. Namely, liturgy has been touted, dare I say, as an encounter with God, often couched as a dialogue in the 20th century, a dialogue between God and human beings gathered for worship. I don't deny that that insistence has had liberative potential in response to an earlier tradition that imagined worship, let's say, as a court ceremonial, an audience of the subjects with their sovereign, or in other traditions, as a school where pupils gather for instruction, 
or if you want a more contemporaneous image, as a charging station where your batteries are recharged for the work of justice. Don't get me wrong, all these images hold truth. It is when they become the one and only and dominant image that they bear dangers, I think. So, back to my question. What room is there to think about creation and the cosmos as a foundational uh, element, part of the encounter of human beings with the living God in worship? For those of you interested in theology, narrowly conceived, here is a very quick map of what this might look like in, um, uh, in terms of a theological argument. And I'm simply going to go through five quick steps. If this doesn't interest you, stay tuned. We'll get back uh, out of the micromanaged theological voice uh, in a second. But here we go. This is how I would root this argument. First, the universe is brought into existence not by chance, but by the creative energy of God. So far, it's a no-brainer, I think. Second, being created and called into existence is gift. And this gift of existence, of everything created, calls forth praise by everything created. Third, all of creation, although deeply marred by sin, evil, and violence, is continuously God-sustained. These are at least things the Christian tradition would want to maintain. And then very specifically so, God entered the world in deepest intimacy by taking on human form in Jesus of Nazareth living and dying as a part of created reality. And some interesting work has recently been done around the notion of deep incarnation, namely the claim that in the incarnation, God takes on not only human form, but all created reality. If humans are um, made from stardust or come from stardust, then God entering um, Shared humanity has also taken upon God's self, becoming stardust. And then lastly, everything God has created is on a journey through time to its ultimate fulfillment in God, when the profoundest response of everything created will be joyful praise. Now, for my own thinking and argument, the, the, the crucial hinge points of this argument are uh, would be the second claim, namely that in a shared reality of being created is also a shared call to praise and worship and gratitude for the gift of having been created, called into existence. And uh, the fifth claim, namely that in that we touch the telos, the ultimate goal of all existence, which will be joyful praise when God is all in all. Much more needs to be said and could be said, but for tonight, I will simply try and make these claims resonate with um, Pope Francis's own claims um, in Laudato Si especially. Here is the element in the encyclical that is key for me, my argument. In a rather startling move, I say this given the encyclical tradition of the Catholic Church, Pope Francis envisions already at the opening of the encyclical um, a community, a kinship relation between human beings and mother or sister Earth. These are familial, definitely not familiar, categories in Catholic theology. Pope Francis imagines creation in terms of everything created, uh, sharing a relationship of creaturely siblings. 
I think that shifts how human beings think of ourselves in relation to the living world, or has the potential uh, to shift that. A theologian Ian McFarlane, in fact, following a similar line of thinking, has argued that there is a basic equalizing going on here, that if everything created stands in the relation of being created by God to God, there is a basic shared characteristic between human beings and everything else that is outside of God. Now, for Pope Francis, um, this sense of universal communion leads for him to think of all of us not only being in a relationship of createdness to God, but also worshiping God in union with everything uh, created. And again, throughout the encyclical, the term that he uses for this is uh, this notion of a universal communion. The term is not totally new. It actually appears already at the beginning of the 20th century in a very early but key prayer meditation of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. And given that he's buried only about an hour and a half away from here in the Hudson Valley, I couldn't resist throwing in an image not only of him but also of his place of burial. With this notion of a universal communion, things get very interesting for a scholar of liturgy. Communion is not least a liturgical term. We go to communion, meaning we approach the Eucharist. We pray in communion with the Pope, the local bishop, angels and saints, the living and the dead. We, as Western Rite Roman Catholics, are in full communion with Eastern Rite Catholics and in communion, albeit imperfect communion, with other Christians. It sounds grandiose. For Francis, certainly, I hope for myself also, these are not simply poetic words and images, but this kinship with everything created has immediate consequences for lived life and for worship, I would add. For example, Pope Francis makes this startling claim in Laudato Si that because God has joined us in kinship with everything created, we can feel the desertification of the soil almost as a physical ailment, the extinction of a species as a painful disfigurement. The German translation of Laudato Si actually talks more drastically of an amputation or a maiming of the human person because of the loss of other species. And then, to me most startling, uh, Pope Francis claims that because of us, he means because of uh, the human abuse of Mother Earth, because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence. Altogether, what I want to suggest is that Laudato Si here allows us to glimpse worship as something infinitely larger than a group of nice human beings gathered in a nice church building. What we see emerge here is a vision of a shared space of worship, a planetary communion, if you will, with all that exists. 
worship here becomes visible as a posture of life of all creation and by human beings as creaturely kin with all that exists. Obviously, this vision of worship puts a question mark behind much of what we usually think of as worship and of going to church on a Sunday morning. Can we imagine going to church on a Sunday morning as entering into the worship of all creation that began when the morning stars began to sing at the dawn of creation? I try to. But the fundamental question really is whether such a seemingly novel, seemingly revolutionary vision of worship can be substantiated from within the Christian tradition our scriptures, and the history of worship throughout the centuries? My answer to that question is yes. Pope Francis, in other words, is simply rendering visible again a strand that has been there from the earliest beginnings, a deeply cosmic and creation-attuned vision of worship. And there are many glimpses not only in the scriptures, but throughout our history of this. I don't have time to highlight even just the tiniest speck of this. So let me quote a couple of verses from scripture and two or three examples from the tradition, and that will have to suffice. First, not in time, but in terms of um, a, a biblical text from the Hebrew scriptures. Psalm 148. It's a hymn of praise in which the psalmist calls on everything created to worship God. And what is intriguing to me here is that what becomes visible in this ancient cosmology is a vast antiphonal choir. One side of the choir is in the heavens, the other on earth. But their hymn is one shared hymn of praise. And if you look at the psalm, you will notice, I hope, that the psalmist isn't saying to human beings, praise God for the sun and the moon. No, the psalmist is saying, praise God, sun and moon, Praise God, all shining stars. Praise him, highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. And then the other side of the antiphonal choir answers, in a sense, from the earth and the depth. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, mountains, all hills, fruit trees and cedars, wild animals and cattle, creeping things and flying birds. And then humans chime in. The psalm doesn't stand alone in the biblical witness, but let me just highlight one other text from the end of the New Testament um, canon. There is a vision of worship embedded in the book of Revelation that once again includes every creature praising God. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing. And again, they sing together a hymn of praise to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. These cosmic visions of worship do not break off with the biblical witness, but continue through the centuries. Here is not the place to map this rich witness of our tradition in the intervening millennia, but for the sake of uh, Pope Francis, I'll just highlight um, the saint from whom 
Uh, the Pope not only took his name, but also with a quote of whom he began, Laudato Si. Um, St. Francis of Assisi. I love this image of uh, the artist Fritz Eichenberg um, because it imagines Francis not preaching to the birds, which is a, a motif that is frequent, but worshiping together with the animals. And finally, jumping centuries ahead to our own time, um, there is a wonderful text uh, in our current uh, Missal, in Eucharistic Prayer 3. All you have created rightly gives you praise. And in case you think um, this is an ancient text, uh, Eucharistic Prayer 3 was actually drawn up after Vatican II, although it uh, draws on um, ancient um, Western uh, sources. So here in our contemporary Eucharistic praying is the same sounding of uh, worship as something that is all-encompassing, cosmic, something that all creation offers. Where do we go from here? I've lived in the US long enough to know that the immediate question to a sketch of a problem often are quick fix answers. OK, order known, problem identified. Now, how can we green worship or green wash? worship. A plethora of suggestions and concrete worship materials are already available uh, and can easily be found. And I realize many congregations, I think including our own, have far to go here with that still. I want to take a different, slightly different track here in response to where do we go uh, from here. I celebrate all attempts at greening Christian worship, but this is not about quick fixes. This ultimately has to be about an ecological conversion that goes much deeper than any quick fix can offer. The first step probably is to situate ourselves anew as creaturely siblings in the universe. How on earth can that be done? Well, we may want to start by practicing critical mindfulness in our prayers and at worship, reconfiguring how we think about gathering for worship and with whom, seeking to live universal communion with all that exists in our daily life, practice compassion toward all that exists. And a bit more lightheartedly, actually let me move over this quote from uh, Pope Francis. He basically calls us to action. Um, I want to move in a slightly uh, more lighthearted uh, di direction. Well, it is a call to action, um, but a lighthearted one. Um, don't be ashamed to hug a tree. Uh, you share a quarter of your genetic material with trees, if I'm correctly informed. Feel yourself communing with a tree that is your creaturely sibling that worships the creator in its own tree way. And look at this, it was the photography, nature photography of the year 2020. Here is um, a beautiful tiger hugging a tree. And that tiger is in good company. What are other things that can be done beyond the lightheartedness? Let me close with just a couple of things. 
The United States is the world's second largest emitter of planet warming greenhouse gases. And the presidential election coming up will have a big impact on the extent to which those emissions are curbed. So vote. The upcoming election and the Catholic commitment to a seamless garment of life I think in 2020 has to stretch this garment, not only from human conception to natural death, but stretch it across our whole wide world, everything created, everything living. And with that, there are certain things that we can only grieve and lament and change in the midst of the intensifying climate crisis. Relax, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. Second, Pope Francis recently challenged us to consider social, not consider, but do, socially responsible investing and stockholder activism making companies, forcing companies to confront the unavoidable need to commit themselves to the integral care of the common home. The Pope recommended divesting from stock in companies that do not meet the criteria of integral ecology and rewarding those that are making concrete efforts in this transition to put an end um, to put at the center of their activities criteria such as sustainability, social justice, and the promotion of the common good. Have you worked on transitioning to a more just portfolio for your dollars? A third small thing. How do you get to worship and back? Well, right at the moment, we. Pro probably all just walk into our living room and uh, switch on the computer. But uh, once COVID-19 hopefully is um, contained, what is your mode of transportation to worship? Are you still driving a fuel-based car? Have you considered an EV? Pope Francis calls for energy transition, a progressive replacement without delay of fossil fuels with clean energy sources. Go and do it. As Pope Francis said just a couple of weeks ago, each of us can play a valuable role if we all set out today, not tomorrow, today. People must make a choice, he says, between what matters and what does not. A choice between continuing to ignore the suffering of the poorest and mistreating our common home, the earth, or act. And act, I would say, includes the practice of prayer and of worship. So until all creation can worship, we have our work cut out for us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ver, for your insights on the kinship of all humanity and also how we worship with all of creation. Uh, we have a question that came in. Could you speak further about what particular human decisions regarding climate change are impacting the pandemic? Ah, uh, the the arguments that have been made for that uh, connection have to do with um, urbanization, constraining the habitat of um, animals, uh, consuming animals that are probably better not consumed by human beings, and a species and extinction that narrows the habitat of animals, thus bringing them in closer contact with human beings, 
which is probably how this virus jumped across from an animal population to uh, the human population. And of course, if that analysis is correct, COVID-19 will not be the last um, virus um, that makes that jump. You talked about uh, lamenting and mourning, especially when it comes to species that have come to their end. I'm wondering, how would you suggest you do that as a liturgical people? What, what are ways to bring that to our worship? Yeah, I spent uh, the afternoon looking through the species that have become extinct in the last two or three years alone, lots more since in the last 500 years. I found it very moving. I wonder what would happen if we grieved um, liturgically, lamented, maybe even in a specific liturgy rather than in a Sunday worship service. Those species that have been lost not because an asteroid hit the earth or some chance, but because of us, because of climate change and human-induced deterioration of uh, natural habitats. So I grew up in the Pacific Northwest where hug a tree was the phrase that you learned if you got lost in the woods, and that's how you were to stay put, and somebody would find you. I'm wondering, though, for those who are primarily city dwellers, what does that look like? So if you grew up in New York City and Central Park might be your only option, um, what does it look or feel like to try and begin to even broach nature? It obviously has to take place and happen not in some fantasy world, uh, where everybody readily has a nice tree available to hug. Um, and in fact, if you went out in, uh, in Connecticut, uh, many of our trees are very distraught after, particularly this summer, you may not um, have much joy in hugging one of them. They are all very pained and suffering. Um, but I think what I would say to people is um, you need to locate where in your own context there is a tiny slither of created universe um, in sight. Um, and if it's not a tree, um, it might be the sky, it might be the moon. It might be a plant you have and nurture uh, in your dwelling. So there, it might be a little spider that walks along in your home and hopes you will put it outside rather than kill it. Uh, so there are a multitude of options depending on um, your own specific um, context. I'm not trying to celebrate a sort of romantic, pristine vision of nature that really doesn't apply to uh, uh, many people. It, it's more an encouragement to find the slither of um, a created universe where you are. This is another question that came in. You spoke about the need for a deep conversion to enter into a more just kinship with creation. How is this conversion playing out in your own life and your faith? Yeah, I'm on a journey. Um, I think as much as everybody is. Um, and as most conversions go that are real and go deep, it's... Um, a, a long and detailed struggle. I remember first consciously and deeply turning to God in my late teens. It changed everything. When I got up in the morning, how much time I still had for prayer, 
whom I would befriend, how I organized my days, and so on and so forth, what I decided to do with my life. Um, I think an ecological conversion is similar. It ultimately is about everything. How much energy do you use um, in your daily life? Do you really need to set the thermostat as high as you do? Um, what about using more solar energy? Um, what do you eat? Do you need to eat as much meat as you do? What shampoo do you buy? Um, are there microplastics in it? Every little, freaking little bit of daily life has to run through this if I'm on this journey of ecological conversion. Is this way I do life sustainable? Is it an authentic way of living into this communion um, with all created um, beings and things? To go from that question, I'm just thinking of as people are finding things that are greener options or organic options, they tend to be more expensive monetarily. Mm -hmm. Um, people have to live farther out sometimes that are doing the lowest paid jobs and so there has to be transportation used that may not be a bike or walking. I'm just wondering how do you balance the environmental justice with social justice and or, or work those two things together since they're oftentimes um, both integrated and at odds with each other? Yes. Uh, um I am well aware of a sort of fashionable, healthy, organic lifestyle <laughs> that belongs to a particular income class, let's say. Um, I want to move in another direction, and it's the direction that Pope Francis, I think, uh, tried to chart uh, chart in a Laudato Si that the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor has to be intimately linked. And so for me, it's it, it just, it's just one example. It wouldn't be so much about eating the newest flamboyant organic this, that, and the other, or drinking it, but buying local. Um, uh, eating um, food from my own garden, um, sharing food with others. Um, so I think there are choices to be made. Um, and <laughs> uh, learning uh, to be done. It, some of the organic market has been co-opted by, um, by big business. If you don't know about that, um, you need to educate yourself. I need to educate myself. Um, and a whole lifetime isn't enough uh, for that. But um, yes, I, I would affirm the this, this struggle to hold the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor uh, together. You also mentioned socially responsible investing. I'm just thinking you know, many of our students are going into business and investments as especially as they get first jobs too, how do they think about that? What would be your advice for questions to ask as they're going to work into the finance um, industry or as they're just maybe finding their own retirement packages for the first time? What, what should they be looking for? Uh, there are now um, various green options. Um, and you basically have to look at um, where, what causes your money and what companies your money might uh, support. Um, are they companies that prize diversity, sustainability, that don't invest in arms? Um, and other such stuff. And the information is available. It just takes, again, time and energy to learn about 
um, what companies and investments to privilege and which ones to keep out. The good news is that the green investments uh, portfolios seem to be doing well. Um, when I first transitioned, it was a losing enterprise. Um, that's not the case anymore from what I gather, so. Maybe for the last question, I think to the Easter Vigil Liturgy where we praise the work of the bees as part yeah. of our candle. Um, what's your favorite liturgical uh, phrase or maybe your favorite piece from scripture that you connect with this whole creation phrasing together? I have many, but one that always um, gladdens my heart is an image from the third creation story, not in Genesis, but in Job, chapter 38, I think. This image of God calling everything into being and the morning stars breaking into song at the dawn of creation. Um, I want to be a part of that hymn. I think it will never end. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And looking at the next few weeks, I invite all young adults to join in the Theology on Tap, which will be next Sunday at 8 p.m. with Father Mark Massa, who will help us to process the election through the lens of Catholic social teaching. On November 15th, everyone is invited to two events, the first at 11.30 a.m., a view from the Vatican, brunch with Cardinal Tegel. At 6 p.m., we'll be joined by Dr. Ditas Villanueva for the Catholic Faculty Series, Life as a Scholar and Believer. Thank you again to Dr. Berger, and thank you all for joining us. Have a good evening. <laughs>